Hello everyone and thank you for joining this webinar. My name is Meven Wiban and I'm a coastal engineer at DHI Australia. In today's webinar, we are going to talk about modeling of sediment transport and shoreline evolution. This webinar is the fourth webinar of the series of webinar on coastal morphology. The three previous webinars are still available online on YouTube. And today's topic is very much related to what's been developed in the three first webinar. Because during the three first webinar, we've very often seen some um, model results to illustrate the subject we were talking about. And today's webinar will provide an overview of the different modeling tools we use on a daily basis at DHI in order to work on projects. This is the agenda for today's webinar. So we will start by the basic principles of numerical modeling, and then we will go through the different sediment transport and morphological models that are currently available at DHI and that we can use depending on the project we're working on. Before having a look at the models themselves, these are some examples of projects for which coastal morphological modeling can be relevant. So typically, as illustrated on the upper picture, we have uh, harbor constructions and expansions. Um, numerical models are very, very relevant. And this has also been developed during the third webinar. Models are also very useful when dealing with shoreline protection against erosion, as we've seen in the second webinar. So the numerical models are able to simulate the impact of nourishments and the impact of hard structures on the coastal and shoreline developments. So um, these are very useful tools. During the first webinar on coastal processes and sediment transport, we've seen that offshore developments can also have an impact on the coastal morphology. So in these cases, numerical models can help assessing these issues. And it's a bit the same for fixed links like bridges and tunnels or also for pipelines and, and um, trenches in seabed and also in um, offshore sand mining projects or studies. Um, it's very good to have modeling tools, but before starting modeling, some preliminary data collection is necessary. Indeed, we need to know a little bit about the projects that we are going to work on and also try to identify what are the conditions at the site and try to have a first feeling of what are the coastal processes that are going to be relevant to model in order to pick the right modeling tool. And this is a non-exhaustive list of elements that can be very useful for before we start the modeling work. Um, satellite images, historical pictures, and also um, a history of the shoreline's developments uh, can be very useful because these provide a long-term idea of, of uh, the overall trend and also how historical developments can have an impact on the shoreline developments, for instance. We will also be able to use these satellite images for calibrating sediment transport models, for instance. So it's probably one of the first things to do when starting working on a new project is to look at satellite images and how the conditions or the shore has been evolving in time. Bathymetry surveys and coastal profiles are also going to be very useful for the modeling work. First, it will be used as input to most of the models that we are going to see afterwards. But also it provides an estimation of the variability of the seabed in the area, which, uh, which can be very useful in order to understand what are the important coastal processes in the area. Then some other parameters are going to be used as input. So as atmospheric conditions, waves, currents, water levels are going to be used for the as an as input for the model. Uh, sediment properties can also give a first indication of how energetic is a coastline we are looking at. So if we have uh, very coarse gravels or a very fine sand or mud, this can indicate how how exposed is the coast we are looking at. 
And another example of relevant information that can be used is, for instance, uh, maintenance dredging records of uh, navigation channels. So usually the harbors have this information. If, the, if they have to go and dredge on a regular basis, they probably know how much they have to dredge in order to maintain a certain navigational depth. And this can be very useful because it can also be used for the calibration and validation of the model and, and the sediment transport uh, rates that we are going to simulate with the numerical tools. We'll now start with the basic principles of numerical modeling. So what is a numerical model? Well, basically it's an, nothing but an advanced calculator. So it's a super tool that takes into consideration a lot of different parameters and then make some uh, advanced calculations in order to simulate and calculate transport rates and eventually morphology. But as it's uh, taking into consideration a lot of parameters, it's a bit more complicated than just putting a few uh, parameters into it, press a button and then uh, get some uh, perfect results. Indeed, um, any projects require some, um, some understanding of what are the coastal processes and depending on what we want to achieve with the model, uh, we will have to look into details at the different parameters and set a proper modeling scenario in order to uh, achieve the, the end goal of the project. But when this is done in a good way, uh, the numerical models are very useful tools in order to, to, to provide uh, good information and accurate advice uh, for uh, for the coastal projects and and especially for coastal developments and and optimization of the designs. So in the, in in the nature we have continuous parameters in time and in space. Um, these parameters can be velocity, sediment transport, uh, wave height, or surface elevation. Um, any kind of parameters. And basically, what a numerical model do is to uh, discretize a continuous parameter into a certain number of points. So this is done by discretizing the space using a, either 1D or 2D or 3D mesh, and also to discretize the temporal axis by using uh, time steps. And in the end, the accuracy of the, of the model will be determined by the number of points that are used for the, for, for the description of um, of space and time. Of course, this is a very important thing to have in mind that depending on what we want to resolve, we will have to use a more or less accurate resolution for the mesh. And this is one of the difficult part of the modeling is to uh, find the right balance between accuracy and computational time. Because obviously, the more we have points to describe our problem, uh, usually the higher the computational time is. So this is also part of the numerical uh, modeling work is to find the, the right balance so we have the, the, the good description of the processes we want to model with a reasonable amount of simulation time. And for the sediment transport model, uh, this is uh, the way it works in usually in, in numerical models. So this is a schematic way of describing what are the different input parameters and how these are combined in order to simulate sediment transport and morphological changes. So basically we have our inputs, uh, the sediment properties. Then we have uh, waves and currents that are going to move and agitate the sediments. All this will lead in uh, sediment transport quantities. And this will lead to a morphological change of the of the area. And once this area has changed, the next time step will start again and, and the forcing and properties will be reassessed depending on this morphological change. Just a little reminder on coastal processes. So this is something we already seen in the second webinar on, on protection against coastal erosion. So as engineer, we, we usually distinguish uh, different types of sediment transport. So the cross shore sediment transport, which is typically responsible for the shape of the profile. 
Then we have the longshore sediment transport, and this is uh, typically responsible of coastal erosion because there are some gradients in the longshore sediment transport. So when we look at a specific stretch of coast, when there is more sediments that is arriving at this area than sediments that are leaving this area, we will have a tendency for uh, accreting sediments. And the opposite is also true. That means that when we have more sediments leaving the area than sediments arriving in the area, we will have a tendency to erode. And typically, this kind of erosion occurs on the, on the whole profile. So, of course, in the nature, these processes are uh, very often interrelated, but for numerical modeling, we distinguish these two phenomena because we have to, to make some, some simplifications for uh, building up the numerical models. So, here is an overview of the different sediment transport model and morphological models that we have uh, at DHI and that we use on a regular basis. Of course, depending on the problem we are going to look at and depending on the project and depending on many other parameters, we will have to select which numerical model we want to use. First, the, all the data that have been gathered uh, prior to the modeling will already indicate what kind of processes we are facing. But some of the, some of the parameters that are more uh, related to the project itself will uh, have to be taken into consideration. It's not necessarily always very useful to have the most advanced and accurate model for a project. Sometimes a simple but robust model will, uh, will provide good enough answers to the questions we have regarding our project. And it's only if we want to get more into details that we will uh, have a look at the, at the problem with another more precise model. So usually that's how we like working on the project, is to first start a preliminary screening using very simple and fast models in order to confirm what we, what we see that is going to be important. And then if required, we get to a more complex and advanced model in order to simulate more complex processes. So now I will go through um, most of the sediment transport and morphological models that we have uh, at DHI. Just to mention, all the models that we are going to look at are used for uh, non-cohesive sediment transport. We also have some models for mud transport, for instance, but um, uh, I will not talk about them today. So if, we, if you want some more information about them, you can, you can contact me. I'll be happy to answer your, your questions. But today we will focus on non-cohesive sediment transport and sand transport. And basically all the models that we use for sand transport in DHI are based on the sand transport program. So the sand transport program is a process-based sediment transport model that is based on the Fresse and Dijkhoff approach. And this is implemented and the backbone of all the, all the sand transport models that we have in DHI. So basically what, what you can see here and what is, uh, what is done by this sand transport program is uh, that the sediment transport is calculated based on uh, intra-wave timescale and tabulated for combinations of input parameters. And what this model does is to resolve the hydrodynamics and the development of the wave current boundary layer, then calculate the bed shear stress, and after that the bed load transport and the, the, the sediment distribution in the water column, and based on that, calculate the suspended load transport. So this is the way we describe uh, sediment transport quantities uh, at DHI in our model. And this requires, as an input, the description of the hydrodynamics, so wave currents. And basically here we have two different ways of uh, describing the hydrodynamics. Today I will mostly talk about phase averaged models because these are the ones that, that we use more often, uh, at least for uh, sediment transport. So basically what we do with phase averaged models is that we use parameters or integrated parameters to describe what are the hydrodynamic conditions. And based on these integrated parameters, we calculate sediment transport and morphology. Uh, the difference with the phase resolving models 
is that the phase resolving model resolves the flow directly and describes the wave phases and the actual C surface variations in time, which is not the case when we, when we use integrated parameters over time. But the problem with these models is that they're very, very heavy and require long uh, computational time. So that's why I'm not going to talk so much about them today. It's because it's pretty much under development still in DHI. So I will focus on the, on the main tools that we use for the projects. So let's start with the uh, longshore models and especially the, the models for uh, sediment transport in the coastal profile. So this littoral drift model is a very useful tool and that's, uh, that's a very important tool that we use uh, nearly for every, every coastal project. Because what it does is, is based on, a, on an input profile and, and other parameters such as uh, bed roughness and sediment characteristics. It transforms the waves and based on this transformation, the longshore current in the coastal profile is calculated. And based on this longshore current, the longshore sediment transport and littoral drift is calculated. So that's what we can see in the illustrations. On the top picture, we have the, the transformation of the, of the wave. So we have significant wave height. And then we have in the middle the associated longshore current. And then base, based on this longshore current and uh, sediment properties, we have the longshore sediment transport that is calculated. So when I said earlier that this is a very useful tool and that we use it nearly for every project, it's because it's very, very efficient, fast and fast to use. Uh, the computational time is very, very short. And therefore we can assess very long time series. The fact that we can use very long time series easily will provide statistics on the littoral drift. So we will be able to assess uh, what are the seasonal and monthly variabilities, uh, what is the net and gross transport on the, on the long term. And finally, it's very often used for uh, preparing the Q-alpha curves I've been mentioning many times already during the webinars and that we use for, for every coastal project. So that's a, that's a very important and very useful tool in general. And usually we use these tools at the beginning of the studies before getting into more complex and advanced modeling and also for very simple studies where the, this model can be applied. So for instance, here on a relatively uniform coast. And typically what we do is to, is to use uh, available wave data, um, identify representative coastal profile, and then calibrate the littoral drift. So the calibration can be made based on either measurements or uh, also satellite images. And as I said before, this will provide very, very important and key information for the, for the next steps of the study. So we can uh, have a look at or we can understand what are the waves that are responsible for the for the littoral drift. We'll have a look at that a bit later. Um, how the different coastal profiles react to uh, in this area to the to the forcing conditions. What is the yearly variation? Are there some seasonal variations? Then we can assess the equilibrium shoreline orientation using Q alpha curves. It's very easy to 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 estimate what would be the, the transport for different shoreline orientations. So that's also a, a good way of using this tool. Just a word on wave data uh, that are used as an input for these models and basically all the models that we are going to look at. In general, we try to work with as long time series as possible uh, because there are some variations in, uh, in the wave conditions. And so it's very important to, to, to have a look at that when uh, selecting wave data that we use for the models. A bit more about the waves. I've said earlier that we can use uh, the littoral drift model to estimate what which waves are responsible for transport. And that's also something that is it's important to have in mind. 
that sometimes the smaller waves can be more important than the large waves, depending on, on, on the conditions at the site. One very large wave that, that generates a lot of uh, sediment transport, but every, every 100 years is not as important as the smaller everyday uh, waves that contribute that contributes significantly to the to the littoral drift. Of course, it's important to have uh, this considered when looking at the shoreline and at the site, but it's important to understand that it's it's not necessarily the most uh, critical conditions for the for the site we're looking at. And in the end, uh, the littoral drift uh, calculations can also help us uh, making a selection of representative wave events that we will use for more advanced modeling. That's what has been done, for instance, in the, in the example I developed in the third webinar about the optimization of the harbor layout, where due to computational time, we could not model an entire year morphologically. So what we've done is to, is to select a series of representative storms that would be able to, to describe the yearly sediment transport. And that has been working pretty well. And this selection in this example uh, has been done using, um, using uh, lead drift calculations or littoral drift calculations. We will now move on with uh, shoreline evolution modeling in, in one dimension. And then we will look at the area models and, and hybrid models. So once again, this model and the concept is related to longshore sediment transport. So we've seen this uh, profile earlier during the webinar. Basically what it does is, is what as I have explained uh, before is that when we look at a stretch of coast, uh, basically we look at what's arriving and what's leaving. And this is described by the equation that is uh, indicated here. So we'll have the the variation in the cross shore direction of the of the position of the shoreline which is related to the to the gradient in sediment transport uh, over the the height of the of the active depth this model uh, works pretty well when we are dealing with relatively simple cases and quasi uniform coastlines so the model is able to, to describe the coastal evolution for um, protection measures, for instance, as, as we see here, we have a uh, short parallel breakwater on the top and um, a groin uh, in the bottom. But since uh, this is a 1D model, we have to make some simplifications in order to describe what effect this structure will have on the, on the sediment transport. So on the right part, we can see that in reality, we have very complicated 2D circulations. And the way this is handled by the model is by um, adjusting the sediment transport in the lee zone of these structures. It also has to be mentioned that, um, as we've seen in the second webinar, when, when we have very, very oblique wave uh, arriving at the coast, we'll have instabilities along the coast. And this is also reflected in the in the numerical models. So these models will uh, tend to be a, a bit unstable when when we have very oblique waves, uh, and that's 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 uh, something that we have to to keep in mind. And here is an example of a project where we've been using this tool. So this is a coast along uh, Benin in Cotonou, and Basically, the story is that a big harbor has been constructed blocking most of the sediment transport and now the downdrift erosion is uh, significant. The problem is that when the harbor has been constructed, the area where erosion occurs now uh, was not populated, but since that time, the agglomeration has been growing extremely fast and there are quite a lot of people living there. So during the last couple of decades, some mitigation measures have been tried and some groins have been placed along the coast in order to try to reduce the erosion. But the problem is that it's not enough. So basically what we, what we have been doing is to uh, simulate the shoreline evolution and test some uh, changes to, a protection, to the protection scheme that is already applied.
And is, as we can see here, we have a relatively uniform uh, coastline, so we can apply our 1D model. And basically, what has been done is, is to run the shoreline evolution model for about 10 years. And uh, we've done it with, with the actual conditions and with uh, an additional groin. And, and we've looked at how this would affect the shoreline evolution. So this is what we see here, and that's typically the kind of example where we can use this uh, model. And here is another illustration of, of how we've been using the model, is uh, to identify what would be the, um, the shoreline variability with and without the, the groin. And we can see, for instance, that uh, on these plots, the shoreline has been plotted every second month during 10 years. And we can see that when we introduce the, the B groin, we also introduce a huge variability in the, in the shoreline um, position. So that's very interesting to, to, to know before implementing the structure. So to conclude on this example, uh, where we've been using the 1D model for, for shoreline evolution, these models are very useful when, when calibrated. So we, the calibration is done based on satellite images. And then we apply the, the model for different uh, protection schemes and, and see how these protection schemes can affect the, the shoreline. And since the uh, computational time is relatively short, it's, uh, it's, it's very useful in order to test a lot of different protection schemes. I will now um, talk a little bit about the 2D models. So basically the 2D models provide a, a more complex uh, description of the, of the hydrodynamics and therefore of the sediment transport patterns. Of course, these models are more demanding uh, in terms of computational time. So we'll use uh, different models, uh, the Mike 21 FM in this case. This is DHI's uh, 2D model for, uh, for hydrodynamic and wave uh, modeling. So basically what we do is to have a 2D bathymetry, usually based on measurements. So we have depth, and then we use uh, Mike 21 FM HD to simulate the surface elevation and depth average currents. In parallel, we use Mike 21 SW to, to calculate the wave parameters, so significant wave height, uh, peak period, mean wave direction, directional spreading. And based on these uh, hydrodynamic conditions, so waves and currents, we calculate the sand transport in the area. And based on this sand transport uh, fields, we will have uh, zones where we'll have erosion and accumulation. Uh, and when the morphology is included, we'll uh, update the bathymetry and then repeat the, the process during the simulation period. It's a very strong tool to, to analyze sediment transport patterns around, around structures and near tidal inlets, for instance, where the, the 1D approach is not uh, applicable. This is uh, the kind of model that has been used for the for the Vidasen Harbor I've detailed during the, the previous webinar, so I will not detail the, an example here. And I will uh, directly move on to the, to the next uh, model. So what we've seen so far is that we have traditional morphological models in one dimension, so the literal process is FM, that is able to simulate the the shoreline position on, on long time scales. These models are very useful for uh, preliminary screening or simple cases, but the problem is that it can not work so well on complex cases, for instance, submerged structures or uh, offshore breakwater on complex bathymetry. And in these cases, we need to have uh, 2D uh, fields of sediment transport. On the other hand, the second model is a, is a 2D Mike 21 FM sand transport model, which provides what the, what the other 1D model could not provide, so a detailed sediment transport patterns 
and an accurate description of the of the 2D effects. But the problem is that uh, the computational time is much, much higher because we have to solve uh, the equations in two dimensions. And also the problem is that uh, because we don't have um, an accurate enough description of the cross shot transport, the, the shape of the coastal profile uh, becomes unnatural when the simulations for uh, runs for a too long time. And these two types of model uh, led to a uh, a new type of model that we now use more and more in, in DHI. So this is a MIG-21 shoreline model. And the idea behind this model is to try to get the most of the two models that we've just seen before. So basically what this model does is to compute waves, currents, and sediment transport on the 2D area. So we get a detailed description of the sediment transport patterns. But instead of letting the morphology occurring in two dimensions, we constrain the model with a, with a predefined uh, shape for the profile. And this is done by dividing the near shore area in, in strips perpendicular to the shore. And for each strips, we will uh, predefine the, the shape of the profile that we want to that we want to model. And this is very good because then it will avoid the profile to become unnatural, and that will help us uh, simulating long periods. So based on the 2D sediment transport patterns, we will use a modified uh, one-line equation for the for the shoreline movement. And this will result in a advance or retreat of the stretch of coast and of the profile that is uh, predefined. So the idea with this model is to try to use the benefits of the of the two 1D and 2D models together. So here is an example where this model this model has been applied. So this is located in Netherlands, and in this area the a very large nourishment has been uh, has been done, about 21.5 million cubic meter, and the idea with this sand engine project is to to put uh, this huge amount of sand in this area and then let the the conditions feed the neighboring stretches of coast. As this is a as this is a very big project, there are also a lot of measurement campaigns that are done, which can be used for uh, for comparing the model results and the uh, and the natural evolution of the of the nourishment and here we have a comparison of the measurements and of the of the model uh, the shoreline models that has been applied for this project so basically we can see that we have um, measurements of the nourishment at the beginning of the of the simulation and then after half a year and then after a year and a half, and then after two years and a half. What we can see first is that the, the overall behavior of the, of the model seems close to the measurements. And if we look at the numbers, we can see that the model uh, works relatively well. So we have uh, very close results in terms of uh, the position northeast and southwest of the, of the area. So in the end, this uh, this is a very good result, and it shows that the new shoreline model is able to reproduce relatively accurately the deposition pattern northeast and southwest of the of the nourishment area. And this is an animation of the of the simulation that has been extended to 20 years. So first, we had a look at the calibration of the model on the two and a half first years. And now we have this animation showing the, the evolution of the nourishment over 20 years. And so the number of years and months is indicated in the top uh, right corner. And we can see how the nourishment evolves in time. Now I will talk quickly about cross-shore models. So how we model cross-shore sediment transport uh, in the 
in the profile. The problem with the modeling of the cross shore sediment transport is that it's it's uh, very difficult to run uh, long term simulations. That's a bit the same story as for the 2D models that we've seen before. Is that um, the profile evolution modeling is possible, but on the long term the profile becomes unnatural. This is uh, as we've seen before. This is very much even related. So um, the problem is that depending on the conditions, the model requires different setting, whether we are looking at a very strong event or a calmer period after a storm. So that's why it's it's relatively difficult to, to build up the profile after a storm. And, and in the end, the model is very hard to use uh, for long-term morphological simulation. To achieve a, a better uh, modeling of the cross-shore evolution, we would require some to include a more advanced description of the coastal cross-shore processes. And these kind of processes could be handled by the phase resolving models. But on the other hand, these phase resolving models are very heavy in terms of computational time. So it's a, it's a difficult situation, but at the moment, DHI is putting a lot of efforts in, in, in developing this this type of model so I'm, I'm pretty sure that in very soon we'll have some some models that, that are able to do this modeling in a better way but still we have some uh, relatively simple uh, tools that can be used in order to estimate uh, the profile erosion for during extreme events for instance uh, we we can use this uh, these tools for for projects so typically here what we can see in the bottom two pictures is that we've uh, simulated the, the crush or sediment transport for a specific typical strong event. And we've done the same exercise for a, for a typical cyclone event. And we can see that uh, this model is able to indicate where the profile is going to <clears throat> erode and where the profile is going to accumulate sand. This is a this is a useful tool for for project when we when we design some uh, artificial beaches for instance when we want to see what would be the variations what is the natural variation of the of the cross shore profile As we are the developers of our models we are constantly trying to uh, improve uh, the the models that we that we use for the for the projects and here are some examples of uh, type of models that we are currently working on. So this is very much work in progress, but um, I hope that they will be released uh, very soon. And as I was mentioning before, uh, there are some limitations for long-term uh, morphological simulations. Because uh, we require some more uh, advanced uh, wave modeling. So, one of the models we are working on at the moment is the MAG3 Wave FM non hydrostatic model. This model will be a um, 3D model that will be based on uh, non hydrostatic uh, Navier Stokes equations. And uh, it will be able to handle much more complicated waves than the current models uh, or wave models that we have at the moment. And it will also be able to handle, for instance, wave breaking, wave run up and overtopping that will be uh, very useful for some, some projects. So we have good hopes that with a better description of the waves, we will be able to improve the sediment transport calculations. I have also talked about the MIG-21 sand transport model and the shoreline model. Even though these models are working pretty well, we are continuously working on improving them. So um, these are some of the new features that we are working on. Uh, we would like to uh, implement a dune erosion module in the MIG-21 model. And also, as I mentioned in the, in the shoreline model, uh, we have to predefine the 
coastal profile. And one of the idea of, uh, of the new features is to be able to predefine a time varying coastal profile. For instance, if we have identified that there was some uh, winter and summer typical profiles, this would be able to, uh, to be changed uh, during the simulations. And finally, we are also working on combining the traditional 2D morphological model and the latest hybrid uh, shoreline model in one same model. So we would be able to define areas where shoreline morphology is uh, calculated using the, the MIG21 SM model and some other areas where the morphology is uh, calculated uh, using the traditional MIG21 ST. And this is a typical uh, example of uh, what I was just saying. So we can see here that we have a harbor where we have morphological evolution that is simulated. And we, what we can see is that along the breakwater, we have a shoreline evolution that is calculated using the MIG21 SM model. And in the basin, we have a morphological evolution that is calculated in two dimensions using my 21 st It's actually a quite nice uh, simulation because we can see that the harbor is fitting in uh, with, with sand during a strong uh, typical monsoon uh, season. And then once this season is, is over, we have a redistribution of the sand in the harbor due to um, waves coming from the other direction. And it's actually quite interesting because this uh, periodic behavior is uh, reproduced every year. So we can see here that the new season of monsoon is uh, fitting in the, the harbor with sand quite a lot actually. And then once this is over, we can see that the shoreline is ret retreating and we have re redistribution of the sand in the harbor. So this will be handled by the new combined um, shoreline and uh, MIG-21 ST models, morphological models. So that's it for today. Uh, I hope this overview of the numerical tools that we're using at DHI4 projects have been useful for you. If you have any questions on what has been said today, please type in your questions in the Q&A box. I will spend a bit of time on to answer these questions after the presentation. And of course, if you have questions on the previous webinars, the three previous webinars, you can also contact me. My contact details are on the screen at the moment. Thank you very much for your attention.